What excites me most about the deep sea goes beyond uh, the interesting and exotic animals and environments. But it's realizing that this is 80% of, of our planet and we know almost nothing about it. Studying how organisms live in the so-called extreme environments, it forces me to think differently about how organisms function. Um, so I like studying microbes and animals that live at hydrothermal vents, one of the most extreme parts of our biosphere. I really like studying microbes that live in the deep subsurface, meters and kilometers below the sediment floor where energy is really, really limiting. There isn't a lot to eat, and yet there are these giant communities of microbes that live down there. When they discovered the vents, of course, it was this amazing oasis of animals in the deep sea. And the idea was put forth that bacteria that could use the chemicals coming out in the vent fluid, that was the food source for all the animals because they're two and a half kilometers down. Uh, the photosynthetic food can't filter down, it doesn't go that far. And so life in the deep sea was thought to be sparse. When researchers and oceanographers found the vents, that's what they assumed that the animals were doing, eating chemosynthetic bacteria. But the giant tube worms actually have no mouth and no gut. So they had no means of taking up particulate matter. And that was where I proposed uh, that they had chemosynthetic bacteria inside of them and that the worm would have to transport the, the chemical energy needed, this hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, CO2, uh, for them to feed it internally. It turns out all of the major macrofauna at the hydrothermal vents have these chemosynthetic symbionts and that they are abundant through coastal and, and uh, sulfitic sediments, both uh, shallow and deep. It took the hydrothermal vents that negated photosynthesis, so you had to have some other source of food to be able to see it. But then once you saw it there, the symbiosis is found everywhere. Well, a lot of our study sites are at about 2,000 meters deep. Some of our study sites are about 4,000 meters deep, like the ones under the Sargasso Sea in the Mid-Atlantic. But then when we get to the bottom there, we still have to work with a robot submarine to take samples from a drill hole that takes us down another 300 or 400 meters below the seafloor. Every time we want to do something in the deep sea, it is a challenge, even just picking up a bucket. We work with many engineers and operators of the remotely operated vehicles and the Alvin and other submersibles. Uh, we work closely with them to develop the tools that we need to do the work with that we want to do. One of the most important aspects of any research crews for the deep sea are the pilots for the submarine or for the remote operated vehicles. Uh, these are people that are trained. They are specialists in their field. Uh, it, it's a rigorous, I think over two years of training to be able to operate a submarine. They are able not only to pilot the sub, uh, they know how to find the vents with the, all of the various technology involved, and they also know how to do the best sampling. Making a dive into the deep ocean is, an, is a literally a mystical and life-changing experience, at least it was for me. The first thing that happens is you crawl into a submarine like the Alvin, and the inside is about two meters in diameter, or about six feet. And it's you and the pilot and another scientist. And you close the hatch, and they put you in the water, and you're bobbing on the surface there like a cork, and you're not sure that this is a good idea. And then you begin your dive, and once you get below the waves and things calm down, you look out the window and it's this just magnificent light show of all the bioluminescent animals that are flashing as you're sinking to the bottom. And you see these creatures that you, you know, only dreamed of and you realize that the most fanciful imaginings of uh, artists and filmmakers, I mean, pale in comparison to what we see in the deep sea.